Good evening. My name is Matt Lawless, and I'm the Scottsdale Town Administrator. You're now viewing the Scottsdale Town Council work session for Monday, March 8th, 2021. Uh, the local time here now is 17 minutes till 7. Um, I appreciate your tuning in if you're viewing in the future on our YouTube channel. Um, I need to uh, wait 17 minutes before kicking off the meeting here. So if you want to advance your video by 17 minutes, you'll see the mayor bring the meeting to order. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with the Town of Scottsdale's continuity of government ordinance during the COVID-19 disaster. The public officials who are going to be electronically present at this meeting are uh, Mayor Ron Smith, Town Council members Zachary Bullock, Lindsey Brown, Dan Gritzko, Laura Malusi, Stuart Munson, and Eddie Payne, as well as several members of town staff. The public has several opportunities to observe and participate in this meeting. Uh, those are listed at the entrance to the town office and up on the town website. Participation will include the opportunity to comment on relevant matters before the town. Thank you so much for your involvement in Scottsdale local government. Um, I'll mute this line for 16 minutes and then we'll start the meeting. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Matt here. Hey, Matt, it's Jeff. Good evening. I see. You. I, I did my intro statement. We're just um, waiting on our group and uh, recording dead air for a few minutes until everyone comes together. Okay. I'll be in mute. Very good, sir. See you shortly. Thanks.
Hey, Thomas, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Funny seeing you with the mustache. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> My face furniture that I hide all day. Yeah. Yours fills in nicely, I'll admit. <laughs> thank you. I've never let mine grow that long, so I can't tell you. I haven't either. This has been a first. It's kind of fun having the mask to hide it under all day. <laughs> it's gotten me through some awkward stages along the way here. <laughs> yeah, and if you take the mask off in front of somebody, they'll say, holy crap. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Right. <laughs> so. Oh, Lordy. Well, this looks like a pretty good agenda today. Yeah, and I'm don't take this the wrong way, but I'm probably going to put my uh, my report through and probably bow out. Oh, sure. No problem. Though I will say that I've learned some things from Laura related to Excel and pivot tables. Oh, those can be very useful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a matter of not having the knowledge to work them, though. And I, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I As you know, I am just happy. started messing with that and got myself pretty confused in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. I'll be right back. I'm going to grab a glass of water before we start. All right. I'm going to mute. Hey, sir, how's it going? Hey, Dan. I, I'm going to put you on mute just for a second, too, but I'll be right back. No problem. Making sure I'm in.
find myself a um, choose a virtual background. I don't have anything that's not UVA, huh? Yes, I do. Because he's perishing. Should I feed her more? Sure. Poor Sam. Yeah. Poor kitty. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Hello. Ready? How's that new puppy? I'll tell you, uh, I I hadn't I hadn't been up at three o'clock in the morning for a long time. Too <laughs> 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 Yeah, I can see the ball of fire. I tell you, uh, that's cool. Yeah, she's about she's uh well, it's ten weeks old now, little cocker. We lost sales back in August, and. Uh, Glad we glad we got somebody else in the house. Yeah, that's so hard when we lose them. They're just part of the family. I know. Yeah, they great. really are. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes sir, Jim. Sure yep. can. Hey, everybody. Hello, Dan. Hi. How's it going? Very good. How are you, sir? I haven't seen, talked to you in a while. It's been a crazy, yeah. crazy end to the winter. How so? What's been going on? Uh, well, my one son, the videographer guy, just moved to Texas. Oh, wow. Do you find a fun job down there? Or? Uh, his wife. Well, he wants to be in the movie world, and that's Austin is where another work. Oh, out of the yeah, movie. absolutely. That's a good place to be for that. They just left Charlottesville Thursday morning last week, and wow. so they're there now. Wow. That's a big change. Yeah, my daughter-in-law is a nurse, so she starts down there in a week, I think maybe 10 days or something. She's a NICU nurse. Okay. I forget what hospital she'll be working at down there. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. That's a very rewarding position, I imagine. I'm sure it keeps you crazy busy. She worked at UVA before. Oh, really? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hey, Zach. Oh, well, so what area in Austin are they moving to? I don't know. I don't know Austin at all. They're just, they moved to me. Austin is at Austin at the moment. I know nothing about it. Never been to it. <laughs> it's a cool town. It's a, it's a fun, it, there's a lot of great live music there and a lot of arts and kind of a really young, energetic kind of feel to it. Yeah. His two sisters helped him and they just flew back separately. One to West Virginia, well, one to Pittsburgh and one to here. So they both got back late last night. Okay. Yeah, I've only been there once, but I was pretty impressed by it. It's been a week down there. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I think it'll be it's gonna be on our to-do list. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you okay. should definitely go. Dear Navy friends retired there, and I was stationed in Texas on one of my assignments. Austin's a fabulous place. They'll really enjoy it. Cool. Yeah, it's a definitely be interesting. Well, that's I'm glad to hear y'all like it. That's encouraging to hear. Yeah. All right, I've got uh, 703, so let's, uh, got an echo, so let's uh, mute. Uh, <laughs> I am muted. Uh, I'm trying to do this also. All right, how's that? Is that better? Yep, much better. Well, I'd just bring my computer tonight, so Matt would have to keep turning the camera back and forth. 
Anyhow, we've got a big agenda tonight, a lot of things. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'll ask the chief to give his report, please. Chief, unmute. Matt, if you'll throw out my report that I sent to you. Coming right up, sir. Calls for service are down again this month. Uh, mm -hmm. Our officers answered 72. The town or the, the uh, Albemarle County PD answered 14 of them. We had three reportable accidents, one of which was a hit and run. That was a that one was taken by the Albemarle County Police Department because it was at a time when none of our officers were in town. Uh, extra patrols, as you can see, um, are equal to um, our assisting agents, other agencies. And then finally, our summons is, uh, we totaled eight with uh, no parking tickets issued. Um, we had a public safety committee meeting last week, Monday. Uh, it was myself, my grand staff, Dave Puckett, Eddie Payne, Dwayne Carr. Frank Sherwood were there. We talked about the 4th of July and the potential for having mm. or the possibility of having the, the parade. Um, they're putting the application into VDOT, but of course VDOT has to approve it. Uh, if that occurs, uh, it'll be like years prior as far as traffic goes. And mm. um, my request to other agency, agencies to assist us with that the fireworks are possible, but it's not a guarantee. And, and, and like you've seen in typical or previous years, I would be asking the counties or adjacent counties for assistance as it relates to that and the state police like we've done in the past. Um, during that uh, discussion, Eddie asked David Puckett a question as far as uh, Albemarle County Fire Rescue and EMS and how they serve uh, our service area and whether or not it was consistent with what um, Scottsville Rescue Squad used to do. And Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong uh, on any of this. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they are providing the services uh, with a mutual aid agreement. Uh, to my knowledge, they're not going into Buckingham. Eddie, am I correct? In, uh, That's the, what I got to you. Okay. Um, but when they have a, an ambulance that goes out of service down here, um, in the event we had some type of a, an issue going on down in Scottsville, we could request that they move one of their units that are closer to Charlottesville, closer to Scottsville, um, but we have to make that request through ECC. Um, they would be willing to have their, in the event we have a flooding event where we have to evacuate the town and they're not out on calls as it relates to some catastrophic event that everybody's experiencing, um, they would be willing to help us with the evacuation process down on Main Street and, uh, and those areas of concern as it relates to that. Um, the emergency services coordinator, um, the, quest, the question was raised about uh, a train derailment uh, exercise or what would they do in the event of a train derailment. And that particular event and those responsibilities are included in uh, the Elmore County Emergency Operations Plan that is uh, located at the Emergency Communication Center dispatch, for instance. Um, and I've reached out to Maribel Street, who is the overall coordinator, uh, apparently Albemarle County has employed their own emergency services coordinator by the name of, I believe her name is Nicole. Uh, Matthews, I think. Yes, Nicole Matthews. Um, I just reached out her to, to her today with an email uh, to have a conversation with her. Uh, and I was supposed to do that all week and just didn't get down to it till today. But uh, also reached out to Maribel about uh, CERT volunteers as it relates to the evacuation process, but also possibly using them as traffic control with the, with the parade coming up. And she did reply to that email indicating she wouldn't put that email out to her CERT volunteers until June. Um, we also had the question about school buses in the event we had a mass evacuation where we had to have 
uh, large tr uh, venues of transportation or vehicles to move people out. Typically, that's not an issue. Most of the people um, are given sufficient warning and they are able to get their vehicles and go out of town. Quite frankly, we encourage them to go to a friend's place, but we do have the uh, rescue squad uh, out on Irish Road to use as a temporary shelter until they can open up a, a regular shelter um, in El Morro County that, uh, that requires a certain type of personnel, uh, security, um, they get involved, the Red Cross gets involved. It's, it's, a, it's a whole, um, how can I put it, a whole bunch of things have to go into play in order for that to occur, to make it a proper shelter. Um, we've not made any contact with, or when I reached out to Maribel about those buses, no one's contacted Albemarle County about that. Um, so I'll be working with Maribel and Nicole uh, related to that question. As far as code red goes, because that was one of the questions as well. Um, there are no pre-recorded scripts for Scottsville. Um, so we'll be working on that. As long as everybody registers for that notification, they would receive it if we created one and sent it out to those residents in Scottsville. Um, and then we had a conversation with the discussion um, leaning towards having a bi-monthly um, public safety committee meeting. So our next meeting will not be until the first Monday of May. Um, so that's where it it's lays on the public safety side. Um, I have just recently or in the process of completing the transaction with uh, Atlantic Tactical and the purchase of the nine millimeter handguns. Um, everybody is now qualified in carrying those weapons. Um, the other weapons um, per agreement with them uh, are being sold to the officers that carried them. Um, and we have still have a bunch of ammunition in our safe that we'll be purchasing for those 40 calibers. Uh, at this stage, Albemarle County, as I have discussed before, um, has been very generous in including us uh, in their range operations and providing us with the ammunition. Uh, I do have some nine millimeter duty ammunition that I was going to uh, give to them because of their generosity and they have given us much more than we're giving them. Um, but it's not the same ammo that they uh, give out for duty ammo. And that being said, I have to try and navigate um, that procedure of getting that switched out. Uh, of course, Matt will be coming up with uh, the Ag Grant application for the new vehicle today. Uh, I probably will not be online when you all discuss that. Um, it's a setup that has been established by Albemarle County Police Department. So our setup will be the same as theirs as far as equipment goes. Uh, we're upgrading all the equipment, the lights, push bars, uh, computers. Uh, it's one way of upgrading our equipment as we go through the process. Uh, and then Matt, are you going to discuss the uh, server option we discussed? Yes, sir. That's included in the um, loan application. Okay, good. Um, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm still completing reports and preparing to learn to uh, establish other ways to capture the data um, that the state is looking for as when July 1 comes. Um, so more changes to come, I guess. Does anybody have any questions? I do. First of all, thank you very much for the public safety update, in particular around evacuations and, and all that stuff. That, that's all very good to hear. Um, <clears throat> this is just sort of a general question. Um, we do, you know, we get reports on how many calls you guys have, and this may be part of the challenge of just extrapolating the data. But is there a way to see what kind of calls you you you're all pulled for? Um, there is now that Laura has helped me. Oh, <laughs> so cool. Wanna, so, so let me. So let me say that um, I appreciate Laura's help uh, in trying to teach me how to do pivot tables. God bless her because I know she needs more patience than I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I can go into some of them if you want to hear what they are. I uh, mean, I, I just think it'd be nice to hear. Yeah, I'd love to know just like just for my own education. 
Okay, yeah. so there's there's a, a number of calls, and I want to say probably in the neighborhood of 13 or 14 categories, but uh, we responded to, uh, and this includes El Merle County now, okay? Mm -hmm. um, five disorderly conduct calls, two drive under the influence that didn't relate to, to us in any way. Um, one family offense, nonviolent, um, alarm, accidental alarms, assisting in backup, uh, agencies we did we had three uh, we assisted other agencies that had one that would probably uh, be the fire rescue mm -hmm. um, assist citizen we had we numbered six um, we took a report for lost property there were nine suspicious circumstances calls mm -hmm. none of which to my knowledge were generated any reports uh, we had two traffic accidents um, Actually, that's wrong. That should be three. One of them was a hit and run, and that was taken by uh, an Albemarle County officer because we weren't on duty at the time. Um, we had 21 proactive patrols or extra patrols, mm -hmm. um, eight traffic hazard calls. Uh, the number goes to 10 traffic stops, to my knowledge. Um, warrant service, five proactive. Well, I've talked about proactive patrols. Miscellaneous non-criminal three, an animal complaint one. Um, and I think that animal complaint was the one that was related to Tavern on the James. Um, mm -hmm. That was actually handled by um, El Memorial County because they have officers specifically trained in that category. Right. So uh, in the future, what I can do, once I learn a little bit more, perfect this uh, this page that Laura has been very gracious to help me with. Uh, I can include this so that you guys can see it in my next report, probably. Cool. Yeah, that, that'd be really yeah, helpful. Be, yep, that would be okay. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Uh, just to, this isn't for you, Jeff, but just to, since, you know, uh, public health and, and public safety, you know, we combine the committees and um, thank you for your report that takes a whole lot of the burden off of me. But um, from, a, from a public health standpoint, um, in the last year or so, we've been bombarded with statistics and reports and investigations and data, et cetera, et cetera, about the COVID-19. Uh, there was a report that was issued today. Um, it is a report. I don't know the source, but it, it, it was um, televised that um, out of 51 jurisdictions, which is 50 states and Puerto Rico making 51, the uh, place you're most apt to catch COVID-19 is Virginia. We were 51st. Wow. Really? So I, I heard that at five this morning. Wow. So, um, it's something for us to think about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could. Uh, Matt and I looked at that report uh, as well earlier this week, um, and they were looking at four categories. Um, let's see if I can remember them all off the top of my head. It was uh, vaccination rate, positivity rate, death rate, and I'm drawing a blank on the fourth one. Um, the governor's office has been pushing back a bit on, on the publicity around that report, uh, questioning the methodology of the study. Uh, which gave triple weight to the death rate, uh, which Virginia was 51st in, uh, and 23rd in vaccination, which I think got a double weight in their metric. Uh, we, the governor's office is saying we scored so low on the death rate because they were only looking at a week's worth of data, and Virginia did a big data dump in that week um, uh, reporting deaths. So the governor's office is saying that was not all deaths that occurred within a week. That was a week's reporting of a much larger time period's worth of deaths um, mm. that all got scooped up in this. So it doesn't look good, <laughs> certainly, but the, mm. the governor's office is pushing back a little bit on how bad it is. Yeah, and just and my, um... I said it, it is a report. It is one report of many. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, you, you can... And... and... Take it, leave I do it, a lot of work. you know, any way you want to, but it, it does bear we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So just to sort of another another point to make here, I think is or another way to look at this is that that 
um, Charlottesville is very well positioned to distribute the vaccines as soon as they come in. I mean, the uh, there's places up in the big lot and, and uh, the old big lot is, has been turned into a, a vaccination center as well as is known up between nine as well too. So, so the state may well not be in a good, good shape, may or may not be as, as bad as that report shows, but I think we in this area are in pretty good shape actually and prepared now that we're gonna be, be able to receive a lot more vaccine. I think we're gonna be able to get it out to people and, and this area is gonna be uh, gonna, gonna start looking pretty good. Yeah, I hope so. I, I signed up uh, when you first were able to sign up and I haven't mm -hmm. heard anything back. Uh, so I have not had any, you know, so. I'll yeah, it's it's getting the vaccine manufactured is, is at this point is the thing that's slowing it all down. But that has been addressed or is being addressed um, because I forgot which one of the pharmaceutical companies had a vaccine that, that sort of failed, but they're turning all of their manufacturing production over to um, producing either the Moderna or the Pfizer one. So we should be able to see a significant uptick in the number of or the amount of vaccines that are available to us, and we're ready to get them into arms as soon as we get the I just, I vaccine just, to put in. Yeah, the reason I just made my statement was just because I, I like to see Virginia do it better, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We don't want them to there do it right. worse, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I also just wanted to say to, uh, to the chief that um, I think the reports, the more detailed reports that we might be able to get, I think will help us in making a case should we need to raise some more money in the future, in the near future. So I think that would be a great tool for us to have. Okay. Okay, any other questions for the chief? Thank you again, chief. As I told you earlier today, appreciate all you do. Absolutely. Thank y'all. Have here. a good evening. You too. Uh, Chamber of Commerce report, I really don't have anything other than uh, anytime Linda LaFontaine finds something that she thinks is gonna be beneficial to the businesses or individuals in town, she puts it out on the uh, on the uh, email. Yeah. So uh, just keep an eye on that. It's mainly uh, concerning business owners, but uh, everybody is welcome to attend these uh, virtual seminars that uh, she advertises. Uh, ARB, Mr. Bullock. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the ARB wanted to extend it, its gratitude for your support this year of, of moving forward with poor rated properties and our letter and sort of following through with, with enforcing our ordinance. So we'll be sending out a notice soon to property owners of said properties, which will include both the resources that we've pulled together, as well as some pretty clear language about uh, the 60 day timeline for meeting with the ARB and the fines and how they accumulate over time so that residents and owners are more aware of those this time around. Um, and if you know any resident or property owner involved in this category, you can let them know that they meet with the ARB, the fine goes away. That's sort of it. Um, what we really want to see is progress on the properties. I don't think we're, we're, we're not interested in penalizing people, we're interested in making progress uh, and working with people on that. So, um, Thank you for your support in that way. Um, we're working on so a Windows COA for 380, or no, on a 496 Valley Street. No, that's not it. What, 358? Oh, my number's all mixed up. Thank you, 358 Valley Street, um, which has been helpful for us just to think through Windows, because in addition to fences, that's sort of like a new thing that's happening, which is great, because people want to fix their buildings. Um, and so we're working through that right now. Uh, there's also been some attention at 496 Valley Street, which is the telephone exchange building. I, you may or may not be familiar with it. It's hard to see from the street, but it's back behind where the space was. Um, but it's this cool old building. There used to be a telephone operator in there. Um, so we've got a COA there right now. Someone wants to redo it. It's unclear if it's going to be an apartment or maybe some temporary lodging, but um, just more sign of activity. And for us on the ARB, it's an exciting one because it's a change of use. We don't deal with that in properties a lot. If business businesses are businesses, they stay businesses, rentals stay rentals, homes stay homes, but this is one where we're, we're changing the use. Um, and so that provides an interesting case for us, but uh, it's it's good attention for the town. And so happy to take it on. And I think that's, um, that's what I wanna say. Oh yeah, um, we are gonna also move forward with a couple of property owners who put up fences without getting COAs back in the fall. We're gonna come up with a way to address that with them. One property owner may not know they're actually in the historic district, which is one conversation. And then the other one does know, 
and wouldn't have gotten the COA approved as it was had we not had we been informed. Um, but we also want to make sure that we communicate with them in a way that is constructive and so that we know exactly what we'd like to work with them on. Um, I don't think we're going to ask anybody to take anything down, um, but potential for modifying structures or doing things to make them fit uh, their location. And then lastly, we have a, a member of the ARB rotating off. Their term ended. They served a little longer than they were supposed to, but it was a pleasure having them on board. Um, so if you know anyone who is interested in applying to serve on the ARB, have them shoot a letter of interest to the town office, and we are going to interview applicants at our next meeting, the first Thursday of April, which is <laughs> April 1st. Okay, that's all for me. Zach. Uh, before we get to Lindsay, let me uh, just say uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, both Planning Commission and ARB uh, will probably be a little bit more busy in the future. I noticed there's a uh, under pending contract pending sign on the property across from the Dollar General. So uh, oh, all I, all I know that. is that, that's all I know about it right now. Oh, cool. We just keep our eyes and ears open for that. And one thing mm -hmm. I wanted to mention to uh, to Zach, I uh, sat in on their meeting the other night, and there was uh, a comment made about why the Barnetts may not have been here the other evening uh, when the issue of the windows came up. Uh, Eve Barnett, as I was told Sunday, is having some pretty serious cardiac issues at the moment. Oh, so no. They, they probably, if they weren't at the hospital, they weren't venturing far away from the hospital right now. Mm -hmm. So that could have been a reason for their absence last week. Okay. So that being the case, let me uh, ask uh, Ms. Brown if you would give a report on Planning Commission. Sure. Um, I have a very short report. We had a public hearing on the special use permit at 501 Valley Street, the little building between, um, uh, I'm totally drawing a blank, uh, the coffee shop and, <laughs> uh, and the bateau. Um, so that has passed and we'll be coming up to you guys shortly. And um, aside from that, we really had a pretty quick meeting last week. We, we discussed again, um, we're starting on zoning text amendments. And we, we have started with intent definitions and some of the uh, numbers for uh, village residential. Um, and after another brief discussion last week, we've gone ahead. We have um, suggested going to a public hearing and we will have that public hearing on our first meeting back uh, on April 5th. And um, We'll go ahead and, and see if we can't move forward with uh, with the suggested the suggested edits on those parts of the zoning text. Okay, any questions for Lindsay? Uh, Treasurer. Yes, sir. Uh, we're now uh, two thirds of the way through the current fiscal year. Um, closing in and trying to land this budget as closely as we can um, after a lot of ups and downs. Um, we've all been following economic news very closely uh, and watching the local impact of how the COVID pandemic uh, interfaces with local businesses. Um, most folks are hanging on, but there's still a lot of employment challenges and reduced spending that we're seeing here locally. That shows up in um, a pretty wide mix of good and bad news uh, here in the, in the town budget. Um, we have um, sales tax and meals tax below where they are for a normal year, uh, but not quite as bad as we were afraid it was going to be when we made this cutback forecast. Um, bank franchise tax filings have come in, although the actual payment has not. Um, and that gave us a little bit of good news. Um, on the whole, folks have a little bit more money in the bank than we expected that they would, um, but not as good as it was last year. Um, same kind of story with business licenses. Uh, those were due March 1st, um, and most of them came in. We're missing a couple of uh, the medium-sized larger accounts so far, 
um, and we'll um, start assessing the penalties uh, after the end of this month. Um, but the ones that we've gotten, you see some businesses actually did better uh, year over year. You can imagine the kind of sectors where uh, the people are staying home, maybe working on some projects or the prices of things went up, the business can do more. Um, but other businesses, especially the restaurant sector, are down from last year. So we see the good news and bad news there. On the spending side of the current budget, we've been able to maintain um, the uh, target budget reductions in several categories, but we've also had unforeseen expenses in others. So part of the budget recommendation um, here later on in the agenda is the supplemental appropriation for the end of this fiscal year to keep it in balance. Um, the single biggest change on that is the grant and loan application for the police vehicle replacement. Um, that's a project that um, we want to move on as soon as we can um, because of uh, the need for vehicle replacement. We didn't know that was going to be that urgent when we made this budget. So those are the kinds of changes to consider um, as we steer this uh, budget towards its conclusion in June 30th. Um, happy to answer any um, line item questions about the financial report or um, discussion about local businesses and how they affect the town. Any questions for Matt? If not, we are pleased to have Supervisor Price with us this evening and I'll ask her if she would like to go next. Oh, thank you, Mayor, I appreciate that. Um, I'll be very quick. I know y'all got some other uh, presentations tonight. Last week at our board meeting, the two major things we addressed were the community development fees and of course the budget. Um, turning first to the community development fees, it's been a number of years since Albemarle County has um, increased their fees. Uh, there was sort of a, a part uh, of the fees increase, but over the course of those years, the expenses to the department have risen about 10% and the fees have not kept up with it. So county staff is looking at, um, at how to address this and as an interim measure, a temporary fix, there will roughly be a 10% across the board increase in community development fees. But one of the more interesting things that came out of their review is the different ways that different jurisdictions establish their fees. Some of them do based upon the square footage of the development, the improvement that's gonna take place. Others do it based upon the estimated increase in the value of property um, after it's either been you know, built or improved. Um, the other thing we ran into is most jurisdictions have been like Albemarle County and have not um, adjusted their fees for some period of time. So it's really going to take a good bit of work in order to figure it out. And there's sort of a philosophical question that we addressed as well, and that is should an individual property owner or developer be responsible for paying the totality of the fees and the fees should be based upon a rational relationship to the amount of work that community development staff has to put into it, or should they pay a percentage, say 75% or 80% in recognition of the fact that developments do gen tend to generate a positive benefit overall for the county um, based upon, excuse me just a second, let me just let those people know I'm not taking that call, mm -hmm. um, based upon the fact that improvements do um, benefit the community at large. So again, it's an interim fix. It'll be about a 10% across the board increase right now. And county staff will look to do some studies to actually reach a decision on the long term what the fees should be. Um, but given that we're just starting on our comprehensive plan and we're right in the, middle, the beginning of the budget season, we don't expect that to take place anytime soon. And that leads into the second major topic. And that was we received the county executives proposed budget, about $465 million. It's a balanced budget, no increase in the property tax rate. Although we do recognize that if your property assessed value has gone up, then your property taxes will go up as well. Residential property went up by about 5% um, overall, but most of our commercial business and industrial property decreased in value, most especially in the restaurant um, and in the hotel and in a lot of uh, brick and mortar store businesses. So um, still a lot to deal with there. Um, we will have over the next four weeks or so about uh, six or eight of these budget work sessions. Our first one will be on Wednesday. Um, and that's really where most of the time is going to be spent. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. 
Um, after that, I do have to bow out. I've got something I've got to prepare for for tomorrow, um, but I will be happy to try and answer any questions that you may have at this point. Thank uh, you, Mr. Super Supervisor, I have a question for you. Yes, Councilor Gritzko. What did the county or what does the county say when they think about tourism going into this summer as COVID does start to slowly move in a better direction? What what have you heard or what discussions are there are related to the different facets of the county with wineries and the tour sites and also the other industries related to that? I think I would say at this point that there's still great uncertainty. Um, Councilor Gritzko, I, I think most of us are in that cautious optimism that you've expressed as we move out of the depths of winter into spring, as we see more and more people being um, not just eligible, but actually getting their vaccinations. Um, you know, I've heard various reports that we might be able to reach that mythical herd immunity uh, by June or July. Um, and obviously that I think will have a, a great positive impact. I, I believe there's a pent up um, demand yeah. that have to get back out and do things. And so if, if things continue to progress the way they at least appear that we're moving at this point, that I, I would say in late summer, we might be able to see some real positive increase. But at this point, I would have to say there's still a great deal of speculation on it. Okay, that's what I was mostly interested in. And from a, a tour operator perspective, Charlottesville is one of our areas that we go to. And Charlottesville is actually yeah, because of Monticello and Highland and Montpelier, mm -hmm. University of Virginia, et cetera. But all that said, I was just interested to hear what you had heard from the county. Thank you very much. Yeah, and the other thing I would add, um, Councilor Gritzko, is um, I did ask the county executive specifically whether the proposed budget for Albemarle County was based upon any expectation of additional CARES type funding. And the answer to that was no, that it is not built in at all. Now, having said that, what I've been reading in the news is that the $1.9 trillion bill that the federal government um, is, is, is enacting um, will provide some funds um, sort of across the board in a number of areas, but we have not, at this point at least, calculated any of that into the anticipated Albemarle County budget. It may be that we'll end up having, you know, so, something really positive come out of it, but I I guess it's the old thing, you know, budget your expenses high and your income low, um, <laughs> you know, to avoid getting into financial trouble. And I, I have to tell you, I, I think uh, we were really, really well served by our county staff this last year um, to come out of the pandemic last year, at least, in as strong a position as we did. Um, we hope that this will be a good year because we have had to defer some of the um, planned capital improvement and things like that. And Councillor Malusi, I, I saw your hand as well. Thank you. Um, before I ask a question, I wanted to pass on to Mr. Gritzko. Um, UVA has actually, um, for the graduation, which has a huge impact on the Charlottesville tourism industry, is not hosting guests for mm -hmm. graduation and may even not have it in person for the graduates themselves. So that's a, a, a big hardship on our local hospitality for sure. Um, my question, um, Supervisor Price, is about the property assessments. I've been approached by a number of residents um, with questions about property assessments and wondered if you could just talk to maybe the, the various categories that they're doing those assessments or areas that we're being compared to. Within the town of Scottsville, I have neighbors whose property has gone up and I have neighbors whose property has gone down in the same area. Um, and so wanted to get some more information or at least maybe get networked to somebody that can answer those questions for our residents. Yeah, I, I, um, I apologize. I don't have the name of the person right off the top of my head, but I will get that for you. Um, I've also received some similar inquiries about, you know, the differences in assessments. Um, the, the, the manager of, the, of that section of the county staff over the last several years has dramatically co closed the gap between the actual property assessments based upon real estate transactions and the value of the assessment that the county is reflecting. And, um, and as that gap diminishes, it's an indication of the accuracy of what the assessments are that, that the county is, is coming up with. Um, about 20% of the properties are personally um, evaluated every year on, on a rolling basis. 
So we don't have the staff to go out and you know examine every single property, um, but there is an actual um, percentage of about 20% that is um, looked at in person every year. Um, but basically what they look at is what's happening with the real estate market. And that can have a tremendous shift um, even within a same neighborhood. For example, I had a constituent contact me and you know the question was why was their house which was one story and X number of square feet valued higher than their neighbor property and immediately next door, which was two story and large and, and more square feet. And you know, what comes back is that particularly in neighborhoods where there are aging population, the single story ranch uh, per square foot is a much more valuable property than the multi-story because of the ease of being able to get around on the one story. And then you get into, you know, many other things. Does it have a carport? Does it have a garage? Um, but e each one is, is a, can be looked at. There is a process when someone gets their assessment that they can, you know, um, contest it. Um, and Councillor Malusi, I will send an email to you as well as the mayor and town administrator um, so that they can share it with everyone else on the, on the town council um, of who that contact person is. Um, and I apologize. I, I just, the name just escapes me at the moment, okay. but they're very, so when those come in. It's the real, the real estate sort of um, like the qualities of the individual house, are they being compared to other properties within Elmore County specifically, or are they being compared to other properties in the surrounding area? So well, that was one I, question. I, I didn't know the response. Yeah. I think the basic thing would be within Albemarle County, but if you're on the That's peripheral, the problem. Okay. then it, it, I mean, it's just like if you're going to, to purchase a property and they look at comparables, Mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I, so if you're in the middle of Albemarle County, mm -hmm. your property is going to be assessed based upon other properties in the middle of Albemarle County. But mm -hmm. if, I don't know, if you property, maybe the property line went between Albemarle and Fluvanna. I don't know of anyone who might have that sort of a situation. There's a number of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Including Councilor Bullock. Council <laughs> <laughs> I used to um, live on one, yes. Yeah. And, and, but that it, but actually that, that can make a significant difference because okay. of what the county offers. Um, you know, I, I've spoken to a number of um, property owners in our adjacent counties who they sort of bemoan the fact that they're not in Albemarle County because the, the services that are provided here, mm -hmm. exceed what they're able to get in their county. It's all of those variables that, that come into play. And even things like how close are you to a fire hydrant? You know? Right. Uh, Right. What, what the road you're on. So there are just too many vagaries for me to be able to address. But um, but the, what I've experienced at this point, any constituent that has contacted me with a question about their assessment has been able mm -hmm. to get a very, and, and actually very thorough response back from the assessor's office. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to getting that information from you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I apologize. I do need to leave. I know y'all got another presentation coming, um, or several. Of them the Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, next on the uh, agenda is my report, and I'll make it quick. Uh, best thing that's happened to me in the last two weeks was Friday when I got my second vaccination shot and had absolutely no side effects. So it was, uh, it was. It's over and done with, we hope. Uh, I've had a couple of meetings with uh, Matt and uh, Supervisor Price since we last had our, or had our last council meeting. Also had a couple of meetings with the chief just to keep up to date on what's going on in his department. Uh, as I said, I, I sat in on uh, Mr. Bullock's ARB meeting the other night, um, made some um, come by the office here every few days to sign checks and take care of some other administrative things. And on this Friday, the chief and Matt and I, and I'm not sure who else will be interviewing a, a candidate for a part-time police position that we have available at the moment. Um, so that's about all I have right now. Anybody have any questions for me? If not, I'll ask Mr. Bowling if he'd like to give any type of report this evening. Um, I have one thing to talk about. I've got the uh, uh, perform of the legal document that the Virginia Outdoors Foundation wants to use for the uh, um, <clears throat> town park. 
uh, that uh, Dr. Hurt and the town is involved in the DOF grant to the town. Um, uh, I, I, it essentially follows the four, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Outdoors Foundation, um, but they uh, um, essentially are, are largely involved with uh, conservation easements, which you may or may not be familiar with. And the form follows that, but it's modified for a, a, like a park operation. Uh, it's going to have to be modified because the uh, uh, the grantor in this case is the owner of the land and the grantee is Virginia Outdoors Foundation. And I'm in the process of making the town an, an, a, 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 an additional grantee uh, so that, that, that they're uh, in the picture and, and have the ability to operate the park in perpetuity uh, under the terms that the uh, foundation sets for. And I'll be sending that to uh, the um, uh, Dr. Hertz representative probably hopefully this week and also uh, I'll, I'll try to send it on to the town council members. I still have to get some more input, a little more input from Matt, but uh, he's been very helpful in the process. Okay. So is this is this something that is it, that we are fairly sure is going to happen? Is it something that Dr. Hurd has indicated that he's willing to sign at this point? Do you know? Everything that well, Matt's shaking his head yes. Okay. Not shaking his head, nodding his head yes. <laughs> and <laughs> everything that I've seen indicates it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just wondering. I mean, we had in the past. It's been it's. A lot of things that we've been talking to him about have not happened. Oh, no, the grant's yeah. been the grant's been granted. That's the big yeah. thing. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I knew that. He, he's not selling you. He's he's uh, giving you an easement for what is what is all in the floodplain. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a great plane. What? Um, oh how yeah. Much so I'm really about excited about being uh, about it happening. So. Yeah. What? What's the? What's the size of the Grant Park we're getting? About fifteen acres. It includes the um, more manicured uh, kind of triangle between the two access roads to the tire factory, and then covers all of the woodland space uh, downhill from there between the factory and the railroad tracks. Yeah. If someone wants to come in and develop that factory site, does that give the town more leverage? Because we like we're managing a park in a development zone or something like that. It does. Certainly, the easement right is permanent. I'm sorry, Matt, could, I didn't quite get where you were saying that the 15 acres is uh, within. Um, south of the factory building itself, there's a, a belt of um, uh, forested wetland uh, between the factory building and the railroad tracks. The okay. exciting Thank thing you. about it is that it's um, um, it, it gives you closer access to the river and it's also gives ties into the town's park system. Um, and it's you want to call it the urban park instead of the more rural park that you mm -hmm. lake that you have. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's a long term project, but it's a it's a it's a nice piece of land. It is yeah. it's sweet. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Then we'll ask uh, Matt to give his report. Thank you, sir. Uh, a couple of items of staff work that are um, not on the agenda we've been working on in the past month. Um, happy to see some springtime weather here now and more outside dining, but in the past month, we also did snow response. Um, so uh, town staff worked hard to um, keep sidewalks clear um, and uh, kudos to VDOT uh, working the midnight shift and clearing all of our roads. Um, we're, we're lucky that the um, Accident reports from the police department uh, were not higher than they were in the past month. So Both stayed home in the snow. Um, in um, pandemic news, the uh, overall numbers around the state and the region um, continue mixed and concerning. Uh, we're, we're glad to see the vaccine rollout that we have, um, but it could always be higher, and we're still concerned about the hospitalizations and, and deaths in the community. Um, it, was, um, it was very sobering in the past month. Um, we booked our farmer's market pavilion for two outdoor memorial services. Um, we're um, proud to offer the space um, and so sorry for the circumstances, but there are um, local families who are really hurting right now. Um, so we, we do the best we can to help with the public health response here and um, 
I want to give a shout out to the volunteers at here, Health Equity and Access in Rural Regions, led by former mayor Nancy Gill. They've made a big push in the past month in distributing all of the sanitizer, um, masks, and health information that we can stop buying. So there's not a whole lot of that um, left uh, behind the camera. They've distributed it to uh, the food pantry clients, um, churches, and small businesses. So it's important that we um, and stay clean, stay distance, and mask up for the next couple of months while we get this vaccine rolled out. Um, thinking about uh, wider policy, uh, I was happy to get a, um, a call from the congressional staff of our new congressman, Representative Bob Bid. Um, he's running his um, field offices uh, differently than his predecessors in that office and really wants to run a network of um, mobile sites that get him closer to more of the residents. Um, so he's asked permission to send some field staff to um, Victory Hall here uh, one day a month to meet with constituents, uh, work on constituent services, and take opinions for or against um, any bills that he's working on. So he will have staff here between 9 a.m. and noon tomorrow. They've booked a few appointments, but it's also available for drop-in. Um, so if you or anyone you know is interested in sharing your thoughts or getting some help from the congressional staff, they'll be here to do that. So we're happy to host that. Um, we host all kinds of different agency partners at the local, state, and federal level at different times. Um, we have the agenda items coming up, but are there any other questions about SAPL? Okay, if uh, no questions for Matt up to this point, then we'll just start it back over to Matt for item A under uh, new topics. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. As you, as you heard from Supervisor Price, the um, county government heard their budget recommendation um, last week, and we're following on the same schedule. We have um, three months available for our budget um, deliberations, uh, public hearings, setting tax rates and approving appropriations. And as I said before, we're looking both at the current fiscal year to um, reconcile uh, that budget and make sure it doesn't end the year in deficit and also planning ahead for the next fiscal year. Um, this is an important time to look at the reality of the economic news and as um, honestly as we can, uh, try to make a conservative prediction about what we think the economy is going to do and how we can most effectively complete the projects that advance the goals of town council. Um, the COVID recession impact continues. Uh, we don't know how quick this rebound is going to be, and 2020 was one of the worst years in American economic history. Um, we still have 10 million people uh, nationally who had good jobs this time last year and don't now. We've only recovered half of the job losses in the past year, and that remains very true in the local economy, in our restaurant sector, and many of our communities to Charlottesville. We see the impacts in the like that in our local businesses. And you all probably know someone whose situation in life is uh, different now than it was this time a year ago. That certainly shows up in the town budget. Um, but your goals as a town council remain very ambitious. Um, in, the, in the months past meetings, you've been able to make lists of your projects, set your priorities um, and goals. Um, that work has been very focused in the past Few months, but it has been a, a project of this council for the past several years, updating comprehensive plans, strategic plans, planning for the future. So you've documented the equipment, the maintenance, the staffing, the construction that you want to do in order to um, make Scottsdale the community of quality that you expect. And you hear from residents over and over the disappointment when these things are neglected or slow to make progress. Um, so staff have tried to respond to that and achieve efficiency, especially in the past year maintaining essential services during the pandemic recession. Um, we've made simple reforms like choosing uh, better savings accounts with higher interest rates, um, lowering the phone bill by choosing better quality providers. We've been winning grants from the likes of CSX to the US Department of Agriculture, um, maintaining uh, tough negotiations with the cell phone company for uh, tower rent on town property. Uh, and even using the threat of embezzlement charges to collect on delinquent tax accounts. In all of these areas, we've maintained efficient local government services and balanced this budget as closely as we can. Um, staff have gone without raises in the current year and taken reduced hours. 
Um, we have one vacant police department position now, and uh, Chief Oliver didn't mention that his full-time officers have been picking up the extra shifts, and they don't earn overtime for their extra shifts. They're just working harder to make sure that everything is patrolled to the same standard that you expect. Um, we have to try to repair some of that accumulated damage because we can't make all of those same kind of cuts again in the next year. We've already done what we can. So the hard choice is going to be whether to increase taxes or give up on some of your goals. We're not going to see the automatic economic growth. Um, passing on those goals means uh, reducing staff, letting equipment wear out and break, or not building the infrastructure that residents and council members have said they want. Um, I think these goals are sound and prudent and reasonable to the town's scope. Um, and we're using all of the all of the revenue tools that are allowed to us within state law. In many cases, the rates maxed out as high as they go, with the exception of one, and that is the real estate tax. The real estate tax is the most common revenue tool nationally among our country's 19,000 municipalities. Almost all towns in Virginia have that property tax, and Scottsville used it until 1995. Mm -hmm. Since 1995. Scottsdale's government has done public service in a sense with one hand tied behind their back. Um, now we find ourselves in deep water and can't tread water one handed. It's time to use every option that we have for the public good. My recommendation is to establish this solid baseline of revenue from the local real estate tax to sustain us through the ups and downs of the business cycle and tourism long into the future so we can keep investing in the things that the community says it wants. We know two things for sure to help reduce the hardship of the new tax. First, we have good news this weekend from Washington, DC. The relief bill that passed the House and Senate includes local aid, enough money that we can delay our tax increase by half a year. Nobody would get a bill until January 20, 2022. Supervisor Price mentioned that Admiral County's budget um, does not include this funding. We have to be a little bit more um, risky with us and including it um, because the situation is so hard. Uh, this budget does not balance without that federal aid. Um, the other thing we know that can help is that we can provide tax relief to low income elderly residents and people with disabilities. A family which is already getting tax relief from the county would not get a big new bill from the town. We can piggyback those ordinances and run the programs the same way. Um, this is, uh, it's hard budget news. It's the hardest uh, budget formulation that I've ever done. Um, but this is the time for um, diligence and determination uh, to keep meeting our town goals, um, provide the basic services in our community that we know are important, um, stick together and take care of each other. Um, if we do this now, um, I think we can keep successful progress going forward. Okay. Sure. Any, any questions at this point? I'm sure you'll have questions, but uh, that's a good overview of what the situation is and what the uh, possible remedies might be. I've got, I've got a couple. Um, what, what was the budget that we passed last year for 2021? <laughs> $540,000, which was modified by $100,000 of CARES money so your current adoption is just under 640,000. 640? Yes. And we'll be doing a supplemental appropriation for about 50,000 here by the end of the year. That would bring that up to about 690. Mm -hmm. and, from, and so I'm just looking at sort of the, um, right now we got 100,000. From the 540 to the 701, what do you think it accounts for that 200,000? What do you think, or 160 rather? Um, 100 of it is federal assistance. The amount of state and local aid uh, passed this past week is about the same as the CARES Act funding. So I would expect our federal revenue um, to be the same. The other large increase um, is in capital spending. You see in um, the current adopted fiscal 2021, we cut almost all of our capital spending. It's only $2,000 of equipment and construction. 
that goes up to 76,000 in the 2022 recommendation. Um, these are the, um, the building repairs, uh, the equipment replacement, and the community infrastructure construction that has been described in our plans. Uh, so we, we go into this recovery, um, investing in that infrastructure uh, and maintaining it in the future. $76,000 is a good, healthy level of capital investment. And, and so that 701, you're also assuming that we're gonna get another 100,000, you said from the, the new the COVID relief bill that was just passed through the Senate um, includes a similar amount as the last one uh, in aid to localities that doesn't have the same kind of strings attached where uh, last year we were trying to spend on new programmatic mm -hmm. uh, on new programs. Um, this funding would be unrestricted in that way. That's right. Virginia Municipal League has already calculated that and shared the numbers with us. So I'm confident in the $100,000 figure. Okay, so then, and correct me if I'm wrong. So comparing to last year, subtracting the one hundred thousand dollars we're going to get from the federal government, and then the seventy six thousand, that would be like five thirty. Yes. So the the basic operations budgets don't change that much. Um, we restore some of the basic operating cuts. Um, uh, maybe run the thermostat in this building a little bit warmer, um, and uh, put in place three percent average raises uh, for the time staff. That's less than what we're seeing statewide. Um, so our police salaries are not going to keep up with the state police, but we're doing the best we can with the means recommendation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Matt, remind me why, why we, we eliminated the property tax in 95? The way I read some of that history, uh, that was also the year that the town boundaries adjusted. So yeah. I think there was a, um, a discussion among town council and the new neighbors that um, folks who came in to Scottsdale on the outer edges of town would not be saddled with a new property tax. Mm -hmm. When the town did that boundary adjustment, we brought in the shopping center and many other businesses okay. along that okay. end of the road. So our, our business license revenue went way up and we could okay. afford to zero out the real estate tax. And that's okay. been status quo for 20 years since 1995. And also in that was the idea that the, I can't, I can't remember the acreage, but it was largely property owned by Dr. Hurt, came into the town and instead of being in the county and the thought was that that would be developed. And over time that would equal the property tax that you were giving up. and as we know, that land has essentially been undeveloped. Sure, it'd be interesting to try to find, you know, how much how much growth was expected in 1995, and um, compared to what folks thought then, um, what has happened? Yeah, and that basically is, well, it's uh, tw almost over 25 years. Mm -hmm. Matt. Um, in listening to Supervisor Price, uh, is it? I I didn't catch um, my answer to this question. How many properties in Scottsville, you know, would would have been reassessed this year? She says there was a rolling reassessment, but they don't reassess all the outmodeled Scottsville properties throughout the year. How many Scottsville properties would be affected? Uh, you know, by this free assessment, because um, if the, the property values remain the same assessment value, um, the taxes don't go up. If they remain level as they are now, I'm sure Albemarle County would have increased their taxes. Um, so I don't want Scotts for residents to get hit with a double whammy. I mean, when I look at my tax bill, I don't want to say, well, my property value went up. I'm paying more taxes because of that. And I've got a Scottsville tax now too. Um, yes, sir. I, I do not know how many Scottsville properties got reassessed and didn't. As I, as I go around the map in the normal course of work, I see that some has and some haven't been reassessed. And then of the ones that have, some have gone up and some have gone down for all the reasons that the supervisor described. 
I don't know how it breaks down in total among the several hundred parcels we have. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, can we get that information? I'd be glad to try. Right, I think that'd be helpful to us to know how many of the residents have been hit with that reassessment increase. Yeah, I, I, mine went up. Uh, I don't know the percentage, it did, it did go up though, by assessment. You know, my, my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that essentially they, 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 they can't it, focus in on all the properties in the county for a reassessment. But basically, they take they take samples and, because it's a uniformity factor. It's a sampling factor, and and then uh, all essentially in a certain area, all you find a percentage increase. So you're going to find everybody's more or less the same. Now, I could be completely wrong on that, but I, I think that's how it works. Um, but that's easily found by calling up the assessor, who's very um, amendable to questions. Glad to do it. I got another question too. I know meals tax is a big part of our budget and we budgeted very conservatively in July and we've often received reports that we that we didn't need to necessarily. In other words, that we did better than we anticipated. So I'm curious to know how much better, let's say, did we do on meals taxes this year than we thought we were gonna do? Mr. Unworth, you have watched this like a hawk. Would you like to feel that one? I, uh, well, the jury's still out. We have, uh... Let's see, at this point, we've received in February the January returns. So we still have to collect February, March, April, uh, and May within this fiscal year. Um, we'll get June's returns in July uh, in the beginning of next fiscal year. So we've got four months left to go. And the fiscal report in front of you, the current financial statement shows $112,000 in current meals tax collection. Some of that, as Matt mentioned, is past collection on old uh, debt. Um, but we look on track to hit the $140,000 that we've recommended in the supplemental appropriation. We bumped that up uh, $50,000 um, from the $90,000 that we had originally set it at. Um, Matt's, I'm sorry, our uh, recommended budget here for Fiscal year 22 moves that up uh, uh, further 15,000 to 155, um, which represents a little bit of continued recovery, uh, but more or less uh, where we are this year. And that feels about right, I think. And during a normal year, what? so we budgeted last year 90,000 for meals tax and a normal, in, in previous year, what would, what would I, meals tax? I mean, I think that we might have been on track to be, you know, flirting with $200,000 last fiscal year had we not had the absolute bottom fallout the way that it did. Um, if you go back in your minutes to that uh, tax presentation that we did, oh, that got all kind of chopped up a little bit. But um, uh, if you go back in the minutes, it's, it's attached there and you can see some of the... Um, revenues in our meals tax uh, returns month over month. And in fiscal year 19, um, from the winter on through June of, uh, of 19, we were in great shape. Things were um, growing steadily. And that trend seemed to be uh, continuing through fiscal year 20 until we hit uh, February, March, April. Right. So if we're going to hit $140,000 this year, we're $60,000 short of what would have been a really, really good year. So that's like, that's, 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 that's impressive. It's, it's a significant drop off um, from, and, and, you know, that's a hard thing to quantify, but um, yeah, from that, where we kind of think that projected growth was headed, it, it seems like a very steep drop. It does, but I guess what I'm also saying is that that's not nearly as dire as we anticipated it would be if we're coming in just sixty thousand dollars under. I mean, we thought we'd be one hundred fifty thousand dollars under. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We only had the one closure at the very beginning, and that's um, that's better than I was afraid it would be. Yeah, and my uh, other question has to do with qualifying for relief. Um, I'm curious to know, like, what is the what is the, how do you qualify? I'm assuming it's based on the poverty line, but is it a certain percentage above the poverty line, for example? And my other question related to that is how many households in Scottsville would qualify for that? 
Um, Albemarle and Fluvanna have slightly different programs for this. Um, the Fluvanna one is simpler. Uh, it has a, a flat number. And if you are elderly and have an income below that number, you pay no tax. And if you are 100% disabled and have income below that number, you pay no tax. Adam models is a little more complicated with some tax brackets to create kind of a sliding scale for you pay part of your tax, half your tax, a little bit of your tax, um, up to full exemption. So um, in future, council would have to choose which of those systems it wanted to follow. Um, we, we can't do both because then we would be taxing people on either side of the county line at different rates. And we have to be consistent on it. So we would either be asking the Fluvanna County Assessor to do a little bit of Albemarle's program for us, or ask the Albemarle Assessor to do a little bit of Fluvanna's program. So the second part of your question, how many qualify? I was able to find that data, and it's about a 10% drop in our expected revenue. 10% um, of our um, folks are low-income seniors or um, elderly, um, elderly or disabled and we qualify for this. So your recommendation is we're collecting on 90% of the tax base and, and uh, waiving 10% of it. Any other Thank questions? Let's move on to item B and keep Matt on the mic. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the um, budgeted uh, projects uh, in, the, in the current year's recommendation to clean up is the police vehicle replacement. Um, back several months ago, you heard the presentation from the police chief about um, uh, vehicle lost in an accident that we need to replace. He had a, a generous offer from an auxiliary officer to sell a used vehicle to us at $25,000. We passed on that because this USDA program is more generous and more effective to us. The town has used this program in the past uh, to buy the one, one vehicle that we're operating now. Uh, we benefit from it as a small rural locality, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Service helps with essential infrastructure in such communities. So this is a community facilities grant and loan. The program grants us 75% of the cost of the vehicle and then gives us a low interest loan for the other 25%. Um, Chief Goldwinkle has followed Albemarle County's uh, loadout recommendation on equipment for a new um, Dodge Durango model police SUV. It's a pursuit rated vehicle, um, custom engineered for police work, uh, and then fully equipped with um, lights, communication, storage equipment, um, and, and such for uh, police duty vehicles. That overall package is just over $60,000. Uh, the cost of the vehicle itself with nothing in it is $35,000. And there's about $25,000 of equipment in the vehicle and a little bit in the station. This proposal includes a contingency of $6,000 for police IT services in the station to support all of the IT coming out of the vehicles. A police cruiser generates a lot more data than it used to. Um, from call logs uh, and cellular service to uh, a large amount of video. So we're still looking at a few different networking solutions to securely store and manage that data. We have some excellent volunteer help from a coding group in Charlottesville to advise on that project. But I think a 10% contingency for IT is reasonable to implement whatever we come up with. So we can apply for that um, promptly and get moving on the procurement, but the um, the program does require a resolution of town council that this is something you would want to proceed with. Um, that's available for action next week, if, if you please. Um, and that would authorize about $45,000 of grant funding and $15,000 of loan funding at an interest rate of 2.15% for five years with no penalties for free payment. Any questions on that issue? I have a question. There's been some discussion in the past about the police truck shifting to the town staff maintenance. Would that occur with this um, vehicle grant loan and purchase? Or is that still up for discussion? It doesn't have to, but it could. 
Um, USDA is happy to give us multiple loans that we're paying on. We don't, we're not required to pay off the one in order to take on the other. Um, but certainly purchasing the new uh, SUV would allow us to shift the truck over. We would just need to pay off the uh, $2,800 $2, that we owe on it currently. Anything else? I actually did. This goes back actually to the original budget question. How much money do we have in our <clears throat> savings account and um, reserve? You have two reserve accounts with the local government investment pool. One of them has $213,000. The other has $223,000. The total is $436,000. Which one of those is the Caldwell Fund? The 223 is slightly larger. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to item C. Uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick and VDOT's with us this evening. Would you like to take over the microphone, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Smith, council members, town staff, uh, good evening. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for having me tonight. I've been working with uh, Matt in the last month or so, reviewing your project for the pedestrian improvements in Scottsville. And we're at a point where I thought it was prudent to uh, brief you on where we stand with that project and some uh, issues that lie ahead. Matt, are you actually able to bring up this, the uh, presentation on the screen? You want me to try to share it? Yes, sir. Do you want your slideshow? Are you able to bring it up? Can you see that? Yes. Mm, yes. Yeah, it's on. Go for it, sir. Thank you. Okay, so as the slide indicates, I'm uh, Tom Fitzpatrick. I'm the new program manager for the Culpeper District for locally administered projects. I'm joined tonight also with my colleague, Carrie Shepard, who serves as the Charlottesville resident engineer. Uh, my predecessor, Kim Cameron, who you may have met or worked with in the past, she's still with VDOT but she has shifted to the uh, Stanton district where she's also handling the portfolio now for uh, Stanton with locally administered projects. But in my capacity, I have both programmatic roles with the district, but I'm also the project coordinator for uh, your town as well. So I can speak specifically tonight to that. Next slide, please. So let's just review the application that was submitted back in 2019. I realize the financial landscape and overall environment in, in the town and the United States as a whole has changed dramatically with the pandemic. Essentially, the goal was to provide access from what I would call the Northwest Levee Trailhead down Bird Street to connect essentially with, with Valley Road. Uh, there was a substantial amount of trail proposed along the park portion from the terminus on the West End, coming up past the regional library, continuing down uh, Bird Street, and then eventually connecting to the existing sidewalk that's at the intersection of Bird and Harrison. There was a secondary task to do various improvements along Page, Main, and Harrison streets where a lot of the sidewalks were in better shape with the exception of Page, which called for a new sidewalk. But as Matt's indicating, there were numerous uh, intersections with crosswalks and ADA ramps to be installed that were all, all part of the original scope and also intended to tie in the Southern levy terminus into this uh, overall scheme of pedestrian access. So that was the scope that we had back in 2019. Next slide, please. And just to review where we stand from a budget standpoint, uh, the town did get assistance from a local A&E that uh, helped develop the scope for both the preliminary engineering right away costs, which are we consider the soft costs, and then the actual construction estimate, which includes not only the physical construction, but also the construction supervision uh, that's associated with the uh, project as well as contingency for the project. So you can see the original estimate in 2019 was just for under $370,000. That was then taken into consideration for uh, inflation, which put us just under 400,000. And you can see to the right, that the total project cost or the grant that was approved was for the $400,000. Uh, and with those figures, we had essentially uh, $45,000 for the 
preliminary engineering, $30,000 for right of way, and the remaining $325,000 for construction, contingency, and the construction supervision. Next slide. So since that time, since the grant was approved, we uh, started to look at the project and also keep in mind, you might say, why is the locally administered program manager briefing when in fact this was designated a VDOT managed project? But once we get a project, the first task we have is to establish an agreement with the locality. And in this case, there was quite a few concerns by the VDOT district staff about the scope and the associated budget. So in my capacity as your local administrator uh, liaison, I've been working closely with my colleagues in Col. We also spent time uh, back in January reviewing the scope on, on the ground. And there are quite a few concerns that maybe were not captured at the time the initial estimate was developed. In particular, there are a fair amount of utility uh, conflicts with the different paths, both on bird and page. And we'll go through those graphically here in just a few minutes with some photos. There's also a fair amount of surveying cost. The fact that the road grades are pretty much out of alignment or the road geometry in general is out of alignment with either existing sidewalks or where the new sidewalks are proposed. So that drives a lot of soft costs to have to identify and establish those grades so the designers can plan to have the sidewalk installed so that you have a usable facility. Uh, the, that many utilities may in fact have to be relocated, or in some cases there's a fair amount of storm structures or storm culverts that appear to be in conflict with the new sidewalks and that could affect costs. The other thing too is the reality is that when we handle the project within the district, there are some overhead costs that might be a little higher than what was envisioned by the initial estimate by the local and the assuming that they had done it directly for the town. So there could be some cost variance there. And then particularly looking at the trail going from the corner of Page and Bird over to the west to the Northwest uh, Levy Trailhead, there's a fair amount of concern with that right away with the Piedmont Housing Authority. If you look at the project they recently did to regrade that area and have some surface culverts for drainage, uh, that in combination with some power lines and then also what appears to be a gas line, there's some pretty significant concerns with some of those costs. And then depending on the, the, the uh, properties along Harrison and Page, there could be some concerns. That said, in meeting with Matt, uh, it appears that many of the residents are very supportive of the project and some of those right away issues might not be uh, substantial, but nevertheless, something that causes concern. And then it's not completely quantifiable, but we are getting feedback both in the area, when I say the area, the Almaro County area with some of their local administered projects, but across the district and across the Commonwealth that COVID does seem to be having a negative impact on construction material costs, namely steel and concrete. So a project involving a lot of sidewalk improvements, the steel and concrete are certainly the, the key components that we would have and are very much subject to those escalations. So it's not clear how that will play out, but part of the briefing tonight is to explain to you that when we go through this process, it can take a year or more to develop the plans and actually obtain the right of way and move into utilities so you're in a position to start construction. So there is probably a one to two year variance as to when we actually execute the agreement versus the time you would see the project completed. And during that time, there could be cost increase, which by the nature of the program is a risk to the locality because anything above the agreement, you as a locality would have to pay. So we think it was prudent to discuss some of these uh, situations and risks tonight so you understand where we stand and, and what we're suggesting to try to move forward. Next slide, please. So in consultation with Matt, we tried to look at the original scope and we broke it down into what we thought were three priority areas based on input that Matt had uh, from, from you all. Uh, the area highlighted in the blue was the first priority to the left on Page Street was the second priority. And then the third priority was the, the Southern Terminus. What's also not really shown on this graphic was while the main priority is Bird Street between Harrison and Page, there was the Western Corridor going out to the Terminus that was considered to be part of that. But we'll go into that in a little more detail as we continue. Next slide, please. So 
So you can see in a little bit more detail, this is an extract of the previous slide. That's a little bit busy, but starting on the top row, you have the library to the west in one picture. Then in the center, you have the proposed improvements. And then to the right, you have a view at, almost at the intersection of Harrison and Bird looking south towards Valley. In this case, what I'm trying to highlight is the fact that at the west end, while there's a portion of the sidewalk that's over by the uh, overnight book return drop box, there is a fair, fair amount of grade change with the culvert there. There'd have to be reworking of the, inner, of the um, stop sign, the signage, but essentially to create a ADA accessible ramp to come off that existing walk and then be in a position to cross over bird, that's fairly substantial in terms of both utility work adjusting grades and then the actual construction costs for the ramps. So that's one part that's a fairly key cost driver. That said, your application did have specific endorsements about the importance of connecting the library to the center of town. So we held that as what we were proposing in priority one is the new Western terminus for the project. Moving more towards the right, the middle section of Bird, generally uh, about the, the probably the from the center to the west or maybe from a, a third of the way from the east to the west. That's pretty straightforward. And you can see in the picture there, you can almost even see this, the stake that marks the, uh, the right of way. I think Matt is circling it now. So you can see there's a fair amount of right of way. The grade's not too substantial. Um, there is the utility pole, but it's possible with the buffer zone between the curb and gutter and the sidewalk that could be accommodated. So that first part's fairly straightforward. We don't anticipate too many problems. But as you go to the next picture on the right and you start to crest that hill and come down the hill towards Harrison, that's where we start to run into some real challenges. So first off, you can see the existing drain inlet there, along with the stop sign and more of an open pan gutter rather than a conventional curving gutter. And that would all have to be replaced. And in addition, we would have to install the ADA accessibility ramp. So that's fairly tricky, but that's probably the easiest side. Now, if we go to the picture, the next picture on the right, now we're on the southeast corner of Harrison and Bird. And essentially, you've got on-street parking both on Harrison and Bird but you've got, you can see here, the stop sign is technically in the road. That's not proper. Uh, the grade there changes dramatically. The, the uh, pavement is about two feet higher than the curb. And just to get the proper width for an ADA accessible ramp, we'd have to expand that sidewalk significantly. So there's a lot of work just to get that ADA ramp in. Now, once that ramp goes in and you continue down Harrison Street towards Valley, the situation improves with what's existing. But between the improvements at the intersection of Harrison and Bird, as well as at uh, Bird and Page by the library, there's fairly significant improvements that have to happen and it's very expensive. Uh, we did talk about trying to eliminate having a retaining wall where you see the old brick walk and just having a turned up uh, curb detail to minimize that, that's possible. But again, it's really each end of the Bird section that's fairly significant. So that's as essentially in short what we have for priority one. Next slide, please. So priority two, going back to the concept of the first priority of trying to connect the library, the second one that was conveyed to us was the idea that the residents, many of them seniors at the Scottsville Elementary School apartments do in fact come out of the apartment building, come up page, turn left, head east down Bird and go down to Valley. And unfortunately, without the presence of a proper sidewalk, they're actually using their um, accessibility carts in the road, which is less than ideal. So the second priority, you can see here that same stake that, that uh, Matt had highlighted before. And if you look down page, there is some grade difference. There is the open culvert, but it's likely that with the right of way, it would be possible to try to get a sidewalk in and connect it down to Main Street with the handicap ramps at both ends, but that would be the second priority. And next slide, please. So finally, we, uh, while we had showed the Southern end in terms of trying to define the different options, we actually went back to the remaining section of or priority three going to the Northwest terminus of the levee trail. And these two photos here, uh, the photo on the 
right is actually starting um, just about at the intersection where the new ADA ramp would be coming off for the uh, library drop boxes. And then you can see on the left side, you get more of the drop off. You can see the marker for the gas line and then you've got the overhead utilities. And again, it's not captured. Well, you can see it more on the right side where you can see the new graded culvert that comes off that. I think it's a utility building, the brick building in the background, but there's some trees and they've got the open culvert. So to try to then get a path uh, in that space with that building, with the utilities, or even if you cross the road and run on the north side was extremely problematic from a cost perspective. So priority three was listed, but uh, you'll see here shortly, we pretty much determined that priority three was outside what was feasible from a financial standpoint. Next slide, please. So looking back at priority one, we highlight the fact there were the extensive repairs that have to have or improvements that have to happen to get the ADA ramp in. And it's not just at that stop sign in the drop box, but also as you cross bird to connect it to uh, bird as well, or actually cross page and then cross to bird. Next slide. Again, the center portion, the 360 linear feet, we thought was fairly conservative, fairly straightforward with not too much risk. Next slide. And then this picture here, if you can make out on your screens, the two red bars that are trying to approximate the grade change that ranges from about 18 to 24 inches. So to try to transition that to make it a usable ADA accessible walk with the you know, necessary um, grades is, is fairly expensive. It, it probably would require a fair amount of adjustment to that intersection with the road geometry, as well as building up the sidewalk to make that work. But again, the ideas from the library to the east, to this intersection in Harrison and Bird, we'd have all two standard ADA accessible uh, sidewalk. Next slide. And then second priority we've shown here, fairly straightforward. Uh, trying to go down page to have the elementary school apartments tied back into Harrison. I'm sorry, tied into Bird. Next slide. And then here you can see again, the problematic areas. There's actually a better shot now on the left. You can see how that drops off. There's a culvert on the left side. There's then the long drainage culvert that's just been cut in that goes back to that brick building. And then it gets very narrow between the brick building and the uh, utility poles to try to get in curb and gutter and a sidewalk or a, a multi-use path. And then even on the other side, it's tight with both the existing parking, the library, and then it gets narrower at the far end where you've got the private property just past the library. And then again, there's a close up on the right that shows uh, both the uh, landscape, the utility poles, and the um, utility line marker there that Matt's highlighting. Next slide. Okay, so what does all this mean in terms of how do we possibly move forward? So in the center and highlight in yellow, there's the grant for $400,000. And re-looking at the scope necessary and the associated cost to execute priority one, we determined we'd actually need a significant increase in preliminary engineering, as well as an increase in right-of-way. But the idea with right-of-way is not so much acquiring property or easements, but more involved with actually locating utilities, particularly storm sewers. That would then leave 225,000 for construction, but again, that number has to cover construction, contingency, and the supervision cost. So once you take out the soft costs, it is fairly limited what's available for construction. So that's why we've taken a conservative approach saying, if you were to proceed with the grant now, we would propose revising the termini to essentially be that block along Bird Street that would get the access from the library to Valley. Now you'll see, we've also indicated that if we were to go after priority two, we would need an additional $250,000. And that's based on there's some economy of scale with the design, it's fairly straightforward, but there would be some right away, some utility costs. And so we're asking for an additional 100,000 for that, and then $150,000 for the construction. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back a second. So Matt's highlighting down to the uh, kind of the lower left side of the screen. So with the existing grant, 
The town had responsibility to pay $80,000, which is 20% of the 400,000. Now, hearing your budget situation tonight, I'm very sensitive to the fact that this is a financially challenging time for everybody. So from a practical standpoint, when you pay into the system and VDOT manages the project, you're only required to pay the 20% for the stage that you're in. So the first stage we would be in is preliminary engineering. However, you'll note, even in terms of reprioritizing the funds to make the project work, we'd be going from 45,000 to 100,000. Now, Matt had already made coordination with our office to say that the, the match would be paid in FY22 after July 1st, and that's acceptable. But if you do the 20%, it's gone from a $9,000 match to a $20,000 match. And so that could be a fairly significant increase given the town's financial situation. At the same time, it would jump from the 6,000 for the right-of-way phase to 15,000. So that goes up quite a bit. So there's, even if the priority one is acceptable from a scope perspective with the revised termini, there is an implication to the funding as to how you pay your portion for the match so we can proceed. Now, one thought was knowing the concern with trying to tie in the elementary school apartments to the new walk up on bird. The fact that the town does pay Almaro County taxes, and that was obviously a, a, a key discussion earlier. It's not out of the possibility that you could go back to supervisor price and say, hey, why wouldn't the county do the match for the town if you were to say, let's pursue priority number two. But that may be a way that if you had to increase funds and the match was say an increase of 50,000, you may be able to get some, if not all that from the county, assuming the county would agree. So that's one way to, to, to potentially look at how to make the funds work uh, given the budget situation. But I think it's important to note that just from our own perspective, there is a significant impact as to when we need the funds and how that distribution affects your, your match. Now, what is not uncommon with the transportation alternative program is that localities will put in the first grant and then oftentimes in year two or year three, put in a, a second or third grant and try to increase the match. That said, in some cases, more money is not necessarily a good thing if that's driving up your match and what you have to contribute. So while priority two may have appeal from a financial standpoint, you may determine that it's just not feasible given the situation now. But if you were to pursue a second grant, the grant applications are opening essentially now till July 1st, and it would be possible for the town to put in for a second grant. Okay, next slide, please. So where does that leave us with the big picture? Well, obviously we'd like to see improvements move forward. That said, we've had to be a little bit more realistic in determining how far the funds will go in terms of the soft cost to have the design developed and to get the necessary right away or to move the utilities to support the project. So for priority one, we could continue to use the grant that you have. It would require an increase from the 9,000 to the 20,000 to get the preliminary engineering going, but overall the project would stay the same in that the town would be responsible for the 80,000. The second idea would be to possibly go in for a, a second application and request additional TAP grant funds. And I tried to explain that on the preceding slide, how you could do that with the idea that we would want you to request at least 250,000 with the idea there would be a match of 50,000. But again, I realize that may have significant financial implications that may or may not be acceptable. And of course, from a conservative standpoint, the whole basis of the agreement is that we like to think the estimates are accurate, but obviously just in the last two years, we've seen some pretty substantial changes, which has affected the current scope. And the risk to any of these projects is that if it goes over the grant, then the locality has to pay the balance. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, the fact the scope has been revised significantly, and there's possibility there could be further escalations on cost, I could see where the town may say, we may need to rethink this altogether. And so it's always possible to say, we appreciate the grant, but at this time we'd like to defer the project and not accept any grant funds. So the third option would be just to table the project and revisit it at a time when maybe the financial situation is different. So I don't need a decision from you tonight. 
Uh, Matt is aware of these different options. Uh, we do have a draft agreement if the town did want to proceed with priority one, so we could start that process. But knowing too that you would uh, prefer to wait to pay the, the match even under the original scope until after July 1st when we start FY22, there is some time for you to discuss this and determine what's best and how the town would like to proceed. The, this is uh, Councilor Grisco. Do you mind if I just make a comment? Sure. Yes, sir. I was just going to say you have signed, sealed, and delivered option three to me. In other words, I'm not trying to be. So first of all, I thank you for your presentation. I very much thank you and recognize an enormous amount of study and research and information has gone on. But you've way, way, way sold the farm on me, meaning, yeah, we, we can't afford to do that at this time. But I do thank you for your presentation. I, and I, I would say strongly as a town, we you've really done a great job in the research of a project we would like to do sometime when we have the resources, but we absolutely don't have those resources. Well, I can certainly appreciate your position and I understand that fully. Uh, I will tell you it has been quite frustrating seeing Albemarle County put out numerous construction contracts that have gotten no bids or one bid that's double the budget. They're having to repackage, go back out. And so it is a little bit uncertain what's going on with the market. And after hearing the, the presentations prior to mine, I can certainly appreciate your concerns with the overall finances of the town. So I am trying to be careful. Obviously, we're in the business of trying to improve things and make things happen. But given this financial situation, I realize you may have to take a different tack. So I'm trying to present yeah. what I think is a realistic and conservative approach. Yeah, I know. And I appreciate that. You guys are a long term relationship with the town and we have a lot of things we want to do over the next 20 30 50 years and there's a long history of things that have happened and, and we really appreciate that but i i thank you for your time and your energy you're very welcome mr fitzpatrick i have a question um and that is this grant is focused on sidewalks but another way to provide safe um access for our town residents is to potentially widen the street and make a bike path that identifies it could be used by bikes but it could also be used by pedestrians is that a possibility um on bird street connecting the library to town and if so what would be the avenues to explore to go that like to widen a street slightly that would encompass a bike path versus a sidewalk well, I will tell you that if you go into more developed parts of, say, Albemarle or even the city of Charlottesville, you'll see they, they've added what they call Shero lanes, which has like the double chevron with the bike symbol. And oftentimes they will just remill or they'll mill a street and resurface it. And once they resurface it, they restripe it to show exactly what you're showing. Uh, I think based on the width of Bird Street, that might be a bit of a push. Um, I don't believe Bird Street is scheduled for repaving anytime soon. There were some minimal pavements or surface treatments planned, I believe, for Harrison Street, and Carrie may be able to speak to that. But I don't think we're doing the extensive milling and resurfacing that you could automatically do it. It's not to say that if you pull back your funds and didn't do the match, that that money could be used possibly to restripe the road. Uh, but I think I'd have to defer to my other colleagues as to how you might do that. Like, Typically, we would have a white line showing the right edge or the shoulder of the road and then yellow lines demarking this, the dividing of the, of the traffic lanes. Right now, that street is unmarked. So it's possible we could look at the road and see if it's possible just to stripe it, as you said, so that there's more awareness. Because I can tell you, just standing out there, the few hours we were last month, there were numerous pedestrians and disabled people using it and they're walking in the road. So there could be some right. signage and or pavement markings that could enhance. I believe the residency recently made Harrison and Bird a four-way stop because there was concerns about people going through that intersection quickly. So that's kind of a, a means of calming traffic. So it may be possible we can work with Matt to look at that more closely. The other reason that I bring it up just for council reference is that you know we're looking at developing options for the tire factory and, and potential um, you know, housing. So that road has already come up in conversation in terms of becoming one-way street or widening 
um, for a safer two-way directional street. So that's that's where, where I'm thinking and why I'm asking this question about potentially looking at paving the surface versus adding a sidewalk. Is there any legal or, or program allowance for shifting money in that kind of way described rather than building sidewalks working on the street surface? I'm not so sure that you would necessarily need to use the grant to do that. I mean, if you were prepared to spend $80,000 on the sidewalks and you were to not spend that money and, and reallocate it, I would think that you could do some of those improvements through signage and paving or markings on the pavement to do that. That's, but, uh, that's one of the things that this council has discussed. We, we well understand the, the cost impacts of of doing a project to your specs and you see how much the engineering and right of way, the, the construction cost requirements that you have. So one of the alternatives we discussed in the accounts is if, if we keep our budget ourselves and use it for some spot improvements, maybe we can get more bang for our buck on our own, understanding that we need to work closely with VDOT for anything that touches your right of way and your property. Yeah, understood. And then I think uh, for the council and the mayor's sake, uh, we had some preliminary discussions. We noticed that in the VTRANS assessment of the state, Fluvanna has actually designated a small portion of the east side of your town that falls within their jurisdiction, so to speak, as a UDA or urban development area. Uh, I think there could be some benefit to the town considering designating the Albemarle side urban development area because just as Councilmember Malusi mentioned uh, safety is a concern, and there is a category on the midterm goals for VTRANS to do safety improvements for UDAs. I understand there's some implications of a UDA. I understand the town has its own ability to control zoning. I don't know how that works if you went that route, but I understand there could be some other financial avenues to pursue funding in the future that could even be more advantageous than the transportation alternative program if you had the UDA. Uh, status. So that's that's not a quick fix, don't get me wrong, but I think long term from a planning perspective, if you were to evaluate that, that may be a viable way for the town to move forward and to have additional avenues for resources to make improvements like you're describing. Any other questions for Mr. Bruce Patrick? Yes, sir. No other questions? No, but thank you for, for a very thorough report. I, I feel very educated about this project. That very much helps my thinking. Yeah, this has been a great presentation. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. And I'm sorry the situation is the way it is financially, but I understand you are grappling with a lot of serious financial issues. So we thought it was prudent to give you a, a fairly detailed breakdown of where we stood. Appreciate yeah. it. You're very welcome. Good luck. Hope things go well. Thank you very, Bye. very much. Bye. Thank very you. much. Okay, next on the uh, agenda is uh, Mr. Culp from the county, Albemarle Broadband Authority. You still listen to Mr. Culp? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor Smith. The floor is yours. Uh, good to see everybody this evening. Uh, it's an honor to present to the town council and town staff, and of course, uh, looking forward to a good conversation. So I wanted to uh, thank Matt for inviting me and Supervisor Donna Price for Bring me back to the town council. I think it's been over three years since the last time I was with everybody in person. And I just wanted to give a brief overview of what's going on with broadband and the Albemarle Broadband Authority. And Matt has a presentation and if he wants to throw it up there on the screen, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Just fine. All right. Yeah, that, that Fitzpatrick guy, he's a hard one to follow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to do my Get best. Get an easier here. topic. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. You know, it's your drawing, drawing uh, designs for roads. It's the same thing with this. But um, yeah, I don't know if we can go full screen. It's a little easier. Yeah, slideshow. That'd be great. Perfect. Let's see how this works. All right, so yeah, I guess you go into slideshow mode there. Um, yeah, sorry, this is always somewhat of a challenge, right? Um, yeah, take take a quick minute. Yeah, there we go. All right, so I, I wanted to get with y'all to just let everybody know that we are still looking for partnerships. Um, the pandemic really threw us into a tailspin and made us fully understand that 
telehealth is a real thing. Uh, you know, originally it was sort of, you know, it would be a nice to have, and mm -hmm. now it's like everybody deserves it. You know, there's a lot of isolation going on, and there's lots of struggle to get digital equity for those who don't have connectivity to do a simple thing like have a conversation with a doctor or a nurse. It's just very important. So we've been working hard to figure out ways to get there. Um, the other thing that happened, which most people are recognizing, and it's been a year, is uh, ha not having our school children uh, in the schools themselves. There was a huge draw to try to get everything going. And we did a couple of things early on in the pandemic to, to help with that. We worked with the schools and we re-released a, a countywide survey, which is available all the time. And we we would appreciate you know the, the town council's help getting more input from the citizens uh, of Scottsville and, and the surrounding area, just getting things rolling there so that we have those reports. Um, one of the things that that did for us, you know, this is hard to see on the screen, but all the, the purple and, and black uh, circled dots are indications from ACPS families alone, meaning these are student households or employee households that lack um, affordable broadband. So it is really, really tough to get uh, connectivity for, for these homes. The schools did a couple of things in the um, urban ring, you know, especially around the, t the town of Charlottesville. Um, they had an agreement with Comcast where if you are a free and reduced lunch family, you received um, Comcast service at no cost. So that is going through the end of this school year. So we're, we're helping a lot of families there. The other thing that the school division did that's been very valuable is they've put out 1,200 uh, Khajiits. And a Khajiit, you can just think of that as like a MiFi hotspot. So uh, AT&T, Verizon have these little boxes that you can connect up to and get internet from. The school division is providing that to the student households at no cost through the end of the year. So 1,200 of those have been distributed out to the school division. So we're, we're working on the areas where, you know, there's no, no service at all. You might have some satellite and in some cases CenturyLink at three meg or in, in some cases less than that. So we have a lot of pockets still in Albemarle to fill. But I wanted to like start on the early years. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Some of, some of y'all might remember this, <laughs> it's, it's a ways ago. Um, but Dwayne Snow, one of my favorite Board of Supervisor members, came into my office one morning in 2013 and said, we've got to get broadband out to the rural areas. And that really started this journey of ours, um, working toward bringing broadband out to the, the rural areas specifically. Um, so, you know, originally, you know, the, the American Recovery and Restitution Act um, through the, the rural uh, Unit, uh, I can't remember what RUS stands for, but um, a lot of things went on then. Uh, unfortunately, we, we put an application in for that funding and did not receive it through the TJPDC. We also had a task force that ran for about two years and we participated in gig.u, which is the Gigabit University through the University of Virginia. So we, we, were, we were learning a lot. And then the the most prevalent thing that happened during those years is we applied to become a, a digital city through with Charlottesville, and that was not also not awarded. So a couple of things got some false starts, I guess you would say. And then in 2015, we finally determined that we needed a plan. We were going after things. So we got a plan together through a grant from the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. And that $75,000 grant was the input to a number of our additional grant applications. So once we got that grant done and we got our initial strategies plan done in 16, we were fortunate um, to have some support through the federal government called Connect America. So Connect America funding uh, came in through our, our partner CenturyLink. And as we get further into this, you're gonna, you, you might realize that that potentially was a mistake. 
Um, you know, at this point, when we took our Connect America funding and, and did a lot of installs, all it did was upgrade old copper. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, we put a lot of money into making DSL a little bit faster. We took, we took a, a bunch of people from zero to three and a bunch more people from three to 10. But that, that can't, turns out to be not nearly enough. So four years later, you can see how fast technology is, has People were really thrilled in 2016 to get 10 meg uh, down and 3 meg up. It was like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. Now it's like, oh, this is horrible. But uh, <laughs> all right, so so going going further, um, this is where people get a little caught up too. So the next slide, 2017. So in 2017, we took a lot of time. We looked at a lot of different strategies and. The end result was at this point in time with the broadband authority, we are not owning or operating a network. So our, our entire goal is to partner with ISPs. And you know, a lot of people come to me and say, well, why aren't you doing as much as Nelson County? Or you know, why is Fluvanna going further ahead than you all and even Buckingham County? The big answer to that question is we've had too many providers for too long. I mean, that sounds really strange, but mm. you know, it's because we have all of this competition. We've got Comcast, we've got CenturyLink, we had Ting come in, we've got Nelson Cable working and just a bunch of different things that, that made it difficult. And then to double that factor, this is a, a, a fact to take away from the meeting tonight and we're the only county in, in Virginia that has four electricity providers. So you've got AEP and Dominion as the investor held and then you've got Central Virginia Electric Co-op and Rappahannock Electric Co-op as co-op held. So power is very similar to rolling out broadband and the Commonwealth thankfully is working much more harder at that. They're trying to bring the two companies or the two industries together so that they can compare and contrast. And there's going to be a lot more about that. I think you you may have read the press about Louisa as an example, but we're trying to build in and, and continue to partner in that 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 realm. So that, that gets me through the decision time. We're not going to own or operate the network. That could change, but right now we're not doing that. So the next slide will bring us a little bit closer. Um, this just gives you the, the example of where we've uh, been successful. So in 17, we did our first uh, Virginia Telecommunication Initiative grant application and received $118,000 from DHCD. This was also a, an advanced DSL. Um, so it, it at least got people up to 25, but that was it. Um, so it was, it was sort of a limited install, but at least, at least got some work on. Then our first hybrid uh, coax um, fiber connectivity was with Comcast. So we, in 18, we received an award from DHCD for 470,000 and did a fiber um, install in Greenwood. So just as an example, you can see the difference in cost. The 284 locations that we passed with just plain DSL were much less expensive than the 178 locations that we passed with the hybrid coax. From that point on, 2018 on, we were all fiber. Um, 2019, probably our most successful project was the Midway project up in the middle of the county um, that went past 341 locations for fiber with the, the new company Firefly Fiber Broadband. So, that's been our, our most successful, it's helped the most people and uh, done a really good job of, of getting things going. So next slide, 2020. 2020, this is, these are the projects that are working right now. So we received a, 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 an award from uh, DHCD for 291,000 and in, in and around Scottsville, Coles Riding Road, uh, and Scottsville Road. There's fiber going in right now. CenturyLink is up there building. They're also building down near Hatton on the other side of the, the, the reservoir, the pond, the lake. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're putting some work in down there and then all the way down to, to Howardsville and Green Creek Road, which is you know a far cry from, from Scottsville. But just to, to let you know, the Southern area of the county is getting a lot of support. Um, so we're, we're working pretty well with CenturyLink. The unfortunate, similar to um, 
VDOT projects, some, sometimes there's delays. And in this particular case, we have a, a delay. We were originally supposed to be live in, in March of 2021. And for various reasons, we've pushed that out until June 5th. Um, in addition to, to everything that was going on, uh, we also received a, an award, a direct award from the governor's broadband office to do an additional Firefly installation uh, that extended um, some, some fiber beyond Midway uh, further north that picked up an area called Birch's Creek. Uh, and that, that particular area is lighting up customers right now. So that was a really good thing. And then the one that's most impactful, I think, to Scottsville in general is the, the new Chantel uh, beam site that's up on the, uh, they call it the James River site, just outside of the town limits on the right as you're going uh, north uh, up on 20. Um, there's a tower site right there that they put their beam service on and they're just lighting that up. So there's people on the north side, it's a little tough to get the signal all the way down into the town, um, but if you go to HTTPS or HTTP, I want beam, very simple. Um, I want beam, no spaces. Uh, you can put your address in and find out whether this wireless service will be available uh, to you as a, as a midterm. We don't see that as a long-term um, solution. We think fiber is the way to go. Uh, we just need to keep, keep working in that direction. So right now we're on pins and needles, uh, and there's various reasons for that. Um, we have a significant grant application in with the Commonwealth um, for 200 2276000 So it's, it's way big. Um, it's our biggest ever. Uh, we're looking at another 1,700 around uh, passings, um, passings being locations that will be passed by fiber. Uh, this thing is, is uh, we're very anxious. We are pretty excited. We think we're going to get the award, but we'll see. The other thing that's very important, or at least it's part of the CARES Act in 2021, Nelson Cable started some work on Irish Road. So there's four or five, there's a couple of churches and two or three businesses. The um, fire station and the rescue station are all on that route. So. Nelson County, uh, Nelson Cable is, is doing some work to pull fiber along Irish Road. Mm -hmm. So lots going on. You're probably like, wow, this is, this is a lot going on. Um, you know, we are looking toward the future as well. We've, we're, we've got f a funding request into the Board of Supervisors. Um, that funding request was for $2 million in CARES Act funding. Um, to carry us through the end of this year and then into the next year. So that's a, a significant amount. It's not as much as what Louisa has put forward. They're working with 15 million. We're working with two. Um, it just, you know, there's just an ongoing need that, you know, we, we continue to work and try to get things done. We're, we're doing a new program. We're starting a new program for digital equity. So we're, we're trying to work toward providing services for those in need who have seen financial hardship due to the pandemic. Um, so that program will be starting. As I mentioned before, the partnership with Dominion and Civic Firefly and uh, REC Rappahannock Electric Co-op is going further than just the Louisa work that was announced. There's going to be some additional um, add-ons to that. So we're looking at creating what, what is typically known redundant fiber rings rather than a cut bringing down a whole neighborhood, uh, a fiber cut should have redundancy that, so that the families and all on that, that fiber um, can continue to do business and that kind of thing. Um, so we, we continue to work on a number of different things. So I just wanted to let, let everyone know that we're doing a lot of work, mostly in the rural areas. Um, I think there's some, some work that we need to do to, to make the urban areas more attractive. You know, one of the thoughts that have, has come up is, is it possible to reduce the cost of apartment living um, by reducing the cost for broadband in the apartment complex? And how would we creatively get to that point? Um, it's just something that, that you know, may make a, a, a location more attractive if there's gigabit service um, available in multiple locations in a town, um, it's likely that 
those apartment complexes, condominiums, townhomes, whatever, will have better resale value or have better occupancy. Yeah. So it's just something to, it's something to think about that we're starting to work on too. Mm -hmm. So uh, next slide. Hopefully I'm keeping you guys excited. <laughs> this, this is my last slide. Um, so I just wanted to give you some, you know, just the, the summary. We've had four years of success with VADI, which is the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative. Hopefully our fifth year will be our biggest award ever. Um, but we're we're anxious. Um, you know, we talked about the 2020. Uh, uh, that's the 837 more locations that are soon to be offered broadband fiber. Um, you know, we've got some CARES funding, uh, not only stuff that's working now, but we're also looking forward to other projects. So if there's things that Scottsville would like us to do, um, you know, if there's a creative project out there that's going to serve a, a, a lot of people and do it well and within some sort of reasonableness, then we're anxious to, to work on those projects. Um, so, you know, how can we assist you guys? I mean, what what, what can we do? We've got uh, partnerships with Nelson Cable, Comcast, Firefly, CenturyLink, and Chantel Beam. So all of them have the potential to, to do more work in the county or, and help the town itself. So I'm leaving, it, I'm leaving a question out there for everybody and also <laughs> I'm here to take questions as well. So Matt, thanks for, thanks for running that slideshow and uh, hopefully I can answer any questions. Yeah, well, I... I... Thanks for your presentation. I, I appreciate hearing about them sort of pulling it all together. You know, the Nelson Cable Company is, is one that I guess I'm more aware of just because being that I've been home for a while, um, I've been able to watch their work down um, Main Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they've laid a significant amount of cable um, on East Main Street and they're planning on going on Poplar Spring Road and Valley Street, which is sort of our, our main corridor down here. And um, speaking with a guy who was laying cable one day said from here, you know, we could run off Forget like one fiber optic line can do like 200 homes. I don't know. It's something crazy, you know, with this stuff, which, which, which gets internet, you know, within town limits actually fairly well covered. So what is the county's relationship then with Nelson Cable Company if they're bringing the internet yeah. down like that? Good, good question. Our, our current partnership is, is for a small project down Irish road. Um, mm. We'd like to continue work with them, and that's a that that could be part and partial to the two two million that's available. So if there's additional work that they're willing to to work with us on, um, you know, I think it needs to be in a in a partnership mode. We have to do it equitably. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we're serving the right uh, nature of customers. But if it's an extension of an existing project and it's going to bring a lot more customers onto gigabit fiber, world-class fiber, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to move forward. So I would encourage continued conversations with that. Jim, I see your hand up. Yeah, do you, do you're you, aware, Michael, I guess that uh, Nelson Cable has a, an agreement with Appalachian Power to use their lines. Yeah, the pole attachments. That's All a, right, okay. Yeah, Which makes a, everything much, much easier. That's right, yep. There's just, there. sometimes there's make ready work. The poles have to be, um qualified i guess certified to to carry the additional fiber that but that's usually not not a big problem mm -hmm. um so yeah i think that's that's a straight up that's a great partnership that nelson cable has formed with with aep that needs to be capitalized on or yeah i guess that's the right word somebody needs to come up with a capital um but we've got to prove it out and show that it's going to provide service to a lot of people yeah Mr. Culp, how are how is ABBA working with Nelson, Buckingham, and Vienna counties? You've mentioned sort of Louisa, you've mentioned the Nelson line coming in um, at that partnership, but how, how are you actively seeking what they're doing so that you can build off of lines that they may be working on? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Laura. I think the our relationship is clearly driven by the planning district commission. So there's not a direct partnership between the two counties. I'd hate to think that we're competitors. Um, so one of the reasons that TJPDC is in place is to kind of bring the localities together. And um, from that aspect, that, that's where the agreements will be forged if, if they happen. More importantly, I think, especially on the, the Nelson side, it's 
through our relationship with Firefly. You know, Nelson is almost, you know, it's going to be a, um, a great representation of what a co-op can do, meaning an electric co-op to form a subsidiary that does fiber broadband to its membership. Um, bringing that same model over into the county, there's a relationship already settled with, with Firefly. We just need to continue working that and benefit from the work they're doing in Nelson. Um, I say this to people all the time, it's similar to power. Um, power doesn't stop at the county lines. If you're on a power line and the power goes out, it doesn't matter what county you're in, you're just out. <laughs> Same thing is true with broadband. We've got to get over the fact that, you know, the fiber is going to end at one line and, and that there's a person on one side of the, of the county that can't get access. It just doesn't seem right. So got to get better at that. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. And then you asked how you could help us. The number one um, frustration that I hear from constituents is they they have one, they know there's one line, but they can't connect for whatever reason. So if there were some kind of map or resource that we could direct them to so they could see what other providers they might be able to contact, um, that is that would be a really helpful resource for our residents. Yeah, right right now, that's that's a great question and something that we're working hard uh, to accomplish. There's a uh, the, uh, a gentleman, John Noreen, who's part of the North Garden Fire Station, he runs out of that location, has been doing a lot of mapping with me and going around and, and getting the actual service area. So he's doing what, what are called pre-qualifications. So we have an internal map that we can now, if any resident comes to me and, and asks for an address lookup, I put it into this mapping tool and I can tell them you know, which providers are where, um, when, when they might receive service. But at, as you've pointed out, wouldn't it be better if the users could be self-serving, meaning they just go to the map, put their address in, they don't have to rely on me to provide them with that knowledge. Um, so good point, we're working on that. Um, the state government has also put together funding for July 1st, where they're gonna start building a more comprehensive statewide map. So you're right on target. We need that type of thing across the Commonwealth. Um, so we're, we're working in that direction, hopefully getting more uh, participate, participation from the providers. And you know, it, it used to be, it was sort of mum, don't, don't talk about this, but now all the providers recognize that they've sort of done the entire nation a raw deal by not reporting their actual service speeds. So the FCC is getting to the point, the Federal Communications Commission is getting to the point where they're forcing the providers to give us accurate data um, to actually show over household by household, road by road, instead of census block by census block, what type of service they're providing. Most people know that the FCC maps, the overall maps are way out of date and also inaccurate because a provider can have service to one location in an entire census block and that whole census block, whether it's five houses or 40 houses, are shown to have that, that type of speed. So that's one of the things that we're working on to get around and make it more accurate. Yeah. The other thing we the other thing we're realizing, hopefully you you all have seen this too, is um, there needs to be more reliability. Even if you have really fast speed, but then every other hour you're dropping off, like your your kids are in the middle of a Zoom uh, training lesson or something, and they drop off. It's just really frustrating. So it's almost like not having. It would be better not having it at all in some cases. But yeah, we got to get the reliability factor in there too competition and what what competition will do is it'll force better reliability um, because the the isps are going to have to keep their customers and the way to do that is to make sure that they're always connected at a fair rate um, so yeah it's, it's it's a good role it's a it's a long long process but every time we're successful with one or more of our body applications we feel like we're getting there it's pushing, pushing the, the rock up the hill. Sometimes it falls back on us, but most of the time we're getting it back up. So, I, yeah. Well, I just had to, oh, go ahead, Ted. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Stuart. No, 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 I'll take the last no, one. No, go ahead. Okay, well, um, the town is fortunate enough to uh, be a customer of CenturyLink's uh, fiber service. 
Um, and I know that they have a relatively substantial amount of infrastructure uh, throughout the town, um, but they only make it available to business customers at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is that um, all of the projects that you've been talking about are uh, open to residential customers? Yes, but they're all good. Good question. It would be great if the fiber offering in the town itself were made available mm -hmm. at a reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. I think if you talk to the right people at CenturyLink, they'll they'll work to provide fiber, but it's going to yeah, cost. They, they won't work with you, will they? No. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that is because they've you know they've got to get these other projects going, and you know, um, so yeah, I, I I see that that's a problem. You know, you want. I think you want to make the town more attractive and a way to do that is to have fiber broadband available to residential. Uh, and, so uh, yeah. Mike, I, I, uh, the, the action talk to the right people at CenturyLink is, I don't know who that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> how about this? I, I've been working with Derek Kelly. He's the government affairs. He, he replaced a gentleman named Rich Shulman. So I could, I would like him to hear from the town as far as the types of things you see going forward, whether it's for business struggling. I think most of the businesses have the opportunity to, to use CenturyLink fiber. What can we do together to make CenturyLink fiber available to the residential areas? Of course, you know, you, I think someone else mentioned it. Uh, Zachary may have mentioned it. Nelson's going to work with you too, Nelson Cable. Yeah, they're so, easier to work you know, with. Maybe yeah. that's a that's a better way. We've we've been learning through all these years that the the regionals are as easy to work with. I mean, there's differences, but they're definitely as easy to work with. So that's something we could could look at as well. Yeah, they uh, uh, Nelson Cable ran cable up to my doorstep um, yesterday, and I just can't get them to answer the telephone to turn it on. So uh, <laughs> okay. if you guys could add an extra person okay. to the office, that would be fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> Sarah Holman, I'll, I'll let her know. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes. I'm ready to become a, a customer tomorrow. If you can you know, get, get. Yeah, I asked her, it's like, can I give your email out? She says, yes, it's Sarah at NelsonCable.com. So. Okay. Sarah. So just to be more pointed, would you share your contacts with these various partners so that we can reach out to them and pass their information on to our residents? Sure. Yeah. That would be so helpful if we don't have a map, at least we can give them the contact with the various Oh, I see the actual so the ISPs. Know. Yeah. Like um, Dan, yes. Meenan, Dan Meenan at Chantel and yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Sarah that would be that would be great for sure. us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure thing. And is that Sarah at with an A or with an H or no H? An H. An H. Yep. H. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Cole? Thank you for your time. Reading, My pleasure. Reading in the paper yesterday about the. Uh, State might get 3.6 billion for broadband. Yeah. Yeah. Man, maybe you get some of your two million. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point. Well, we thank you for all you do, and we'll be looking forward to um, even better things. Thanks for being on tonight. Thank yeah, you. Appreciate your time. Enjoyed it. All thank right. You. Have a good rest of the evening. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Last time on new topics uh, about the Clement Street. Uh, right away vacancy like we did on Holman Street. Uh, is everybody familiar with that? Mm, no. I could use a reminder. Yes, I know about that. Yeah. There's a little bit, little piece of alleyway basically, which is part of Clement Street that mm -hmm. has been encroached upon and never used. And uh, we did the same thing we did with Holman Street over uh, a couple of years ago. So that'll be on the agenda for next two weeks. Okay. And then the last thing uh, under carryover topics, I'll just, uh, ask Matt to comment on that. Uh, I think the Planning Commission report shared it at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, I think uh, so too, but uh, any questions? Well, a little long tonight, but we covered a lot of stuff. And uh, I think- I have a quick question. 
Excuse me. Sorry, mm -hmm. Mayor Smith. About the Clement Street, was this, so we talked about Holman maybe reaching out to residents with similar problem, like similar situations. Was this the owners coming to the Town and Planning Commission or was it us being proactive and reaching out, hey, you've got one of these areas that needs to be addressed? This was at the owner's request. I didn't know about this one. It wasn't showing up on the map that I had. Um, but okay. Um, the Deckers are aware of it as um, an encroachment in their property. And uh, for them thinking long-term about clearing a title and if they ever wanted to sell it, this would be something right. they need to clear up. So they're requesting it. This isn't one that I knew about. Okay. It, it's so not we, shown in the county GIS records, uh, which oh, are the map that we largely use for uh, boundaries, um, but they're not, 100% accurate to, to what survey results will turn up. And that's one of these that the, the survey okay. the Deckers hold shows something different than the county GIS okay. map. I just remember we had a discussion about sort of actively kind of helping residents in that way. So mm -hmm. right, thank you. Okay, anything else on anybody's mind? Is there? Let's think seriously. I think Dan's comments about uh, sidewalks and uh, we're not really in a position to commit ourselves right now for an extra $80,000. We may yeah, have to walk the street as for our next uh, little bit yeah. or do something different. Be thinking about that one. And we'll see everybody next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody. Night. Good night. Stay healthy.